Welcome to LHA Church. You're about to hear another inspirational message from Pastor Jerry Galloway, lead pastor here at Lighthouse Assembly. It's our prayer that this message is an encouragement and blessing to your life. If you'll take out your Bibles and turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. We started here last week and we're going to continue walking through this passage together. Uh, if you have your tablet or your phone with you and you have the uh, Uversion app, you're welcome to go to the More section, then go to the Events tab, and you can pull up. You'll find LHA there, and you can pull it up, and you'll have all of the notes and the uh, passages for today. Revelation chapter 21 is where we're going. We began looking at what heaven is going to be like last week, and you know, the truth is there are many thoughts, and there are many opinions on what people think heaven's going to be like. They have a lot of opinions on who's going to be there, who won't be there. They'll have a lot of opinions on how we get there. There's a lot of opinions on what we do when we get there. Uh, you know, often I have the uh, opportunity and I walk with families through the time of loss of a, of a loved one. And uh, I hear lots of thoughts on heaven in those moments. Uh, lots of people say, you know, well, God needed another angel. And there's people that will say, you know what, well, they're looking down on us today. There's so many opinions. And how many of you know uh, often that we base what we think about heaven on how we think God thinks? And how many of you know God doesn't think the way we think all the time? The Bible says his, way are higher, his, his ways are higher than our ways. And uh, he doesn't contemplate things the way that you and I do. And so the truth is, if we want to know what heaven is going to be like, it really won't do us any good to sit around and just kind of talk to one another and find out. What we really need to do is we need to open up our Bibles, and we need to find out what the Bible has to say in regard to heaven. Because how many of you know, God, the creator of earth, was also the creator of heaven. Can you say amen? He is the one who is in heaven today, and uh, his throne is there. And what we're going to do is we're going to just continue to walk through this 21st chapter, uh, looking at what heaven's going to be like. We looked last week at four descriptions or characteristics of heaven that we find here in this 21st chapter. The first thing we find is that heaven, in heaven, everything is new. How many of y'all like new things? How many of y'all like new things? Amen. Because if you want some old stuff, I got plenty of old stuff at home. I'll be glad to give it to you and I'll take some new things in its place. We all like new things. The Bible says in heaven everything is in a constant state of newness because the curse of sin is not there. And so everything is in this constant state of newness. Then we find, uh, secondly, that heaven is a place where God is near. The verse number three says, now the dwelling of God is with man. He will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Heaven is going to be incredible because God is there, and we're going to be in God's presence for all eternity. We looked as well at the third characteristic. We looked at what is not going to be in heaven. In heaven, there's not going to be any tears. Verse number four says, God himself will wipe away every tear from our eyes. We find there'll be no death there. There's no more funerals to go to in heaven. There's no mourning. There is no sorrow there is no crying and there is no pain. How many of y'all are for all that? Amen. Amen. None of those things are going to be in heaven. And then fourthly, we closed last week by looking at the fact that, that truly not everyone is going to be in heaven. Verse number eight says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur uh, for this is the second death. Heaven is going to be an incredible place, friend. And I wanted to, you know, as I begin to try to describe for you, I have to be honest with you. I, I am at a loss for words to be able to describe for you the, how wonderful heaven's going to be. Friend, it won't be like anything that you can compare to on this earth. You and I have experienced many beautiful things. We've seen beautiful things on this earth, but nothing you've seen on this earth, even in its very best state, can ever begin to compare with what God has prepared for us. It is something so incredible that our minds cannot begin to comprehend. 
And our mind cannot fathom the realities of what heaven is going to be like. In fact, we find the Apostle John, as he is uh, pinning the words that will later become the book of Revelation, he is using word pictures to die to describe what he is seeing. We notice in verse 2, he says, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Heaven is going to be, friends, more incredible and beautiful, and you are going to be, uh, I I think one of the reasons we're going to get now, uh, this, I'm going to give you my opinion here, and that's all this is. I think one of the reasons we're going to get a new body is because this old body couldn't handle what heaven's going to be like. I think this old body just explode when it experienced the glory and the incredible things that God has prepared for us. This morning, we're going to continue on with some more of those characteristics And those descriptions of heaven, I can tell you this morning this, friend, you don't want to miss heaven. Please don't miss heaven over something of this earth. Because the truth is, everything on this earth is temporary. It's not going to last. It's not going to be here. You can't take it with you. You can't, uh, you know, you can't. Uh, set it aside and think, well, I'm going to take it with me. Listen, there is nothing this earth has that will begin to compare with what heaven is going to be for all of us. Look there, Revelation 21. Let's look at verses 9 through 11. One of the seven angels who had seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, and I will show you the bride, the wife of of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God. And its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Friends, heaven is going to be a place of God's glory. Often we talk Uh, about the glory of God, and there are times when we experience, you know, we have a a tiny glimpse, if you will, of the glory of God's presence in a service, maybe that's a service like this this morning, and and you experience an incredible glimpse of the glory of God, or maybe it's uh, in your, you know, you can experience the glory of God anywhere. You could be driving in the car, heading down the road, and the presence of the Lord just fill. Do you know what I'm talking about? Those times when the presence of the Lord just comes in and fills the room where you're at it, and there's a, a sense of wholeness and healing and peace and joy that comes as the presence of the Lord fills that place. The truth is throughout history. There have been times when men and women have been exposed to small amounts of God's glory and it incredibly changed their lives forever. We know that the shepherds around the birth of Christ in Luke chapter 2 and verse 9, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, uh, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. They were awestruck. They, They didn't know what was going on because the glory of the Lord begin to shine around them. Acts chapter 7 and verse 55 says, But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Moses, the man of God, we know Moses led the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt into a land of freedom. And it was uh, in that process, Moses wanted to see the glory of God. And he asked, I want to see your glory. And, And God said, listen, Moses, you can't see the fullness of my glory and live. I think that's kind of where I was talking about earlier. I don't know if our bodies could handle the fullness of God's glory. He said, but I tell you what, I'm going to hide you back here. When I pass by, he said, you'll be able to see the residual or the, the swoosh, if you will, of my presence as I go by. Heaven. It's going to be a place that radiates the glory of God. It will radiate the glory of God. And friend, it'll be like nothing you've ever seen or imagined. John said it's like a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. God's glory radiates purity and every good thing. 
Those times that you remember when you felt the glory and you felt the presence of God ministering to your life and it leaves you forever changed. It leaves you impacted. It leaves you healed. It leaves you satisfied because God's glory radiates everything that God is. It is the essence of God and it radiates from without him. It radiates all about him. If, you know, the last couple of days you have experienced some sunshine. And, it, you know, we didn't get the rain and we didn't get the cloudiness. And it was beautiful blue skies and, and all those white fluffy clouds. And Paul and I was out the other day. And, man, I told her, I said, man, the sun just feels good on your skin. And it just, you could sit there and it, it was cold outside, but it just warmed you up. And it, I tell you what, it changes your lease on life, and it gives you a, a new thought, and it gets you out of the old mully grubs when it's all, you know, gloomy and rainy, and everybody's dragging around, and the sun comes out, and it's amazing the life that it brings. And you know, just like the sun radiates that warmth, God's presence radiates everything that makes him who he is. It radiates his love. Listen, it's not something that I go get. God's presence just radiates his love. It radiates his mercy. It radiates his goodness. It radiates his grace in our life. Imagine with me for a moment. You know, we've experienced little glimpses of God's presence. But imagine being in, right in the very midst of an area where the glory of God is just radiating all around you. And everything. There's nothing evil there. There's nothing difficult there. There's nothing sinful there. There's nothing harmful there. It's only the glory of God, and it's radiating all around you. Heaven is a place where the glory of God is. Look, Revelation 21, look at verses 12 through 14. It says, it had a great high wall with 12 gates, with 12 angels at the gates. And on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel and there were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The next thing we find is this, that heaven is exclusive. Heaven is exclusive. Maybe you wonder often why the walls you know, we're talking about heaven. Why the walls? Why, why the gates? Why the angels that are there uh, guarding? After all, the enemies we find in Revelation, the preceding chapter, Revelation 20, we find that God's enemies have been expelled and they've been cast aside. So why the walls? Why the gates? Why the angels there? It is a picture for us. John, again, is giving us a picture of the exclusivity of heaven. Revelation 21, verses 14 and 15 says, Blessed are those who have washed their robes, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs. Now, that doesn't mean dogs in the natural sense like you and I understand dogs. It is those who live their lives uh, in a very sinful, immoral way, uh, uh, almost to an animalistic uh, element. And the, it goes on to say, those who project the magic arts, those who are sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and, notice this, practices. That stood out to me this week as I was going through that passage. Not only those who uh, lie, they love lying, and they practice. They live in a state of practicing falsehood. Heaven is exclusive. Truth is, we found that heaven is not for everyone. And even the Bible tells us not for most. The Bible says broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many are on that road. But narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And a few are on that road. Friend, I can't tell you that the road of Christianity will be the most populated road. I can't tell you that it will be the easiest road. I can't tell you that it will be the road that everybody will be on with you. But I can tell you this. It's the only road that leads to heaven. It's the road. It's the narrow road. And it leads to eternal life in Jesus Christ. Friend, heaven is more exclusive than anything you've ever heard of. Exclusive meaning this. Having the power to prevent entrance. Having the power to prevent entrance. 
The reality of heaven stands against the modern philosophies of man that says there are many ways to heaven. Now, a key concept in understanding the exclusivity of heaven is the number one. Somebody say one. One. Take your finger and hold up one finger. It's the number one. A concept understanding it is the number one. There's only one way to heaven. There's not three roads or ten roads to get to heaven. There's only one road. Every person who's ever been in heaven or will ever be in heaven gets there the exact same way. There is only one way. Now, there are those who think they'll get there to heaven by being good and doing enough good works. Well, if I've done enough good things, surely then the Lord will let me into heaven. But Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 answers that when it says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. Friends, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. There's no works that will get you there. You can't earn heaven. There's only one way to heaven. Heaven is very exclusive. There's only one way there. Now, there are those who will say, you know what? I'm trusting in Muhammad. He'll get me there. Others will say, I'm trusting in the fact that I'm just a good person, and that will get me there. Others are saying there are many roads and many faiths, but they all lead to heaven. But I would remind you of the words of Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Salvation, salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Heaven, heaven is exclusive, friends. There's only one way to get there. There's only one path to get there. Jesus said, I'm the gate. And in John 14, he said, nobody comes to the Father except through me. You don't go through the church to get to heaven. You don't go through a man to get to heaven. You go through the Son of God who gave his life on Calvary's cross. He's the only one that'll get you to heaven. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. For those who think, well, I'm a good person, I've been a good neighbor, I've been a good worker, I've been a good husband, I've been a good wife. Surely the the Lord will look on those things and allow me into heaven. But friend, that's not in the Bible. That's the problem with that philosophy, it's not in the Bible. There's only one way. There's only one way. And this life, there's one way, and this life is your one chance to prepare for eternity. If today is your last day on this earth, then today is your last chance to choose Jesus Christ and allow him to make you ready for heaven. Hebrews 9 and verse 27 says, And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes the judgment. Friend, this is your one chance, just once. Only one life. So soon it'll pass. How many of you have found in your life, life's going quick? Wow, the older, my dad used to always tell me, the older I get, the faster it goes. And I didn't understand it. My dad is in heaven today, but I'm understanding my dad's words. It seems like it goes faster and faster and faster. It's one life, friend. We get one trip around this planet. It's one life, one chance. Now, is it one way to get there? And one chance, but it's one responsibility. So whose responsibility is it to make sure that you go to heaven? Is it the preachers? Is it your spouse? Is it your family member? Is it your mama and your daddy? Whose responsibility is it? Kids, is it mom and dad's responsibility to make sure that you get to heaven? The truth is, friend, you and I can't ride on somebody else's coattails. You may say, well, you know what? My parents did this when I was a kid, or they did that as when I was a kid to get me ready for heaven. But, friend, that doesn't have anything to do with your will. The time comes in all of our lives. We've got to yield our will to the will of Jesus Christ, and we've got to say with all of our heart, I know he is the Savior of the world, and I need him today. There's only one way, one chance, one responsibility. There's only one who's responsible to make sure that you're ready for heaven, friend, and that's you. 
only you alone can choose. I can't choose for you. Many times in a close of a service, I'll pray for you. But listen, my prayer, friend, won't get you there. I don't ever want you to misunderstand that. I'm just praying for you. You've got to pray for yourself. You've got to have a relationship with Jesus, not the one I have. You see, I have my relationship with Jesus, and you have to have your relationship with Jesus. You've got to know him. Heaven is exclusive. Romans 14 and 12. So, so says, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to who? To God. Revelation 3 and 20 says, behold, I stand at the door. I'm here and I'm knocking. He's knocking at the door of your heart. Some of you, you know, I hear people a lot of times, they say, you know what? We just need to get back in church. We need to get our kids back in church. And we need to start serving the Lord. And you say, you know what? I kind of thought that was my idea. Friend, that's not your idea. He's knocking at the door of your heart. He's drawing you to be saved. He's drawing you to come into right relationship with him. It's not something I, I didn't just decide one day, well, I think I'll get saved. He drew me to salvation. He drew me by his Holy Spirit and reminded me how much I needed him. And he Receive me and made me his child. Heaven, friend, it displays the glory of God. And heaven is exclusive because there's only one way to get there. Let's look on Revelation 21, verses 15 through 17. Here's what we find in this passage. We find that heaven is so big. I mean, friend, it's bigger than even we can imagine. Listen to these words. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city. Its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it is wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, as wide and high as it is long. He measured its wall and found it to be 144 cubits thick by man's measurement, which the angel was using. Friend, heaven is so big. It's hard for us to imagine. Heaven is so big. You and I, you know, I thought this week, how? I said, Lord, how can I help these people to understand how big heaven is? I thought, well, I could put a picture up there. But a picture just won't do it justice. I'll be honest with you. I kind of feel like John, when he's trying to describe the book of Revelation, he's writing those things out. And he says, well, heaven was like. Listen to this. Listen to what the Bible describes the size of this city. This city is 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles high. Now, you say, wow, that's pretty big. Let me give you an idea how big. If the city is 1,500 miles high, our atmosphere is 100 miles high. So the wall of the city would go 1,400 miles beyond our atmosphere that we know. It's 1,500 miles wide. It's a cube. If you, you say, well, how big is that? Well, if you were to try to drive around the perimeter of that city, it'd be 6,000 miles. If you got into your car and you drove 70 miles an hour, it would take you three and one half days nonstop. You can't stop for a bathroom break. There's no McDonald's breaks. Driving nonstop. Three and one half days at 70 miles an hour just to drive around the perimeter of that city. Now listen, don't forget, this is God's house. This is where we're going to live. Whew. You know, I, when Paul and I, we, were, we had this conversation yesterday, and it, wasn't even, it didn't have to do with my sermon. We were talking about the first house we lived in. The first house we lived in, you probably, I don't, this platform might be a little bigger. <laughs> It was little. We were, I mean, and yo, we were happy as two little larks, but we lived in a little house. In fact, it wasn't until we lived in multiple houses until we got one that the closets were enough where we both could have our clothes in our bedroom. For the first multiple years of our lives, all of the three things of clothing that my wife has <laughs> filled up that closet, I always had to keep mine in another part of the house <laughs> because we never had a house that had a big enough closet. You didn't have them little closets like this. And I think, you know what? We have these goals in our lives. We think, well, I want to I move up a little better and I want to live in something better. Now, listen, friend, 
You're getting ready to move into a house that nobody has a house like. You're getting ready to move into a house that is so big. Listen, you hear people say, well, yeah, I live in a house, and it's so many square feet, and it's got this, and it's got a this guy, you know, this size, a big TV on the wall, and we've got this kind, and every guy, you know, dreams of four or five car garages and, and all those wonderful things. And listen, you're getting ready to move into a house, my friend, that is so big, nobody's ever imagined it, nobody's dreamed it of. It's so big that it was created by the hand of God. It's it's created in the mind of God. It's created in the heart of God. And listen, he's not just doing it. He's preparing it for his people. Because Jesus said in John 14, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, he said, I'm going to come again. And I'm going to receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you can be also. You, let me tell you, he's preparing an incredible house for his children. Look at your neighbor say, I'm getting ready to get a new house. Woo! The good news is this doesn't come with a mortgage. This one won't break down. There's no insurance. There's no property taxes in heaven. Let me tell you, the price, the price for the new house has already been paid. The price for the new house has already been taken care of. The mortgage was taken care of on a cross called Calvary. It was paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's paid in full, my friend. It's paid in full. Heaven is going to be incredible. You will not want to miss it. I am so saddened in my heart where I see people, they put so much lock, stock, and barrel into the things of this earth. Listen, friend, when, when I have the best thing that I have, really, when I compare it to heaven, is just kind of like garbage. The best thing I've got, it's nothing. Listen, don't miss heaven over garbage. Don't miss heaven over something that's not worth. Don't miss heaven over something of this earth, my friend. Don't miss heaven. Don't miss heaven. Let's go on. Revelation 21, verses 18 to 21. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold. as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper. The second was sapphire. The third, chalcedony. The fourth, an emerald. The fifth, sardonyx. The sixth, carnelian. The seventh, chrysolite. The eighth, a barrel. Ninth, topaz. The tenth, chrysoprase. The eleventh, jacinth. And the twelfth, an amethyst. Twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each gate, ladies... Each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. I saw this week I was reading, and it was a story about a man who on this earth had, a, had gotten a, a mass, an unbelievable amount of money. He was known as a very wealthy man. And he was bothered by the fact there would be a day when he would die and everything that he had acquired and worked for would be left behind for his kids and everybody else to fight over. So he said, God, there's got to be some way. I've worked so hard, there's got to be some way I can take some of this with me. And the Lord said, no, 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 no. Can't do that. And this guy persistently kept asking, Lord, I just want to take some of this stuff with me. I've worked so hard for it. God, you know the blood, sweat, and tears that I gave to earn this. And Lord, I'd just like to be able to take. And one day the Lord said, finally, you can take one suitcase. Whatever you can fit in a suitcase, you can take that one suitcase with you. As good as the guy thought hard and long. What can I fit into a suitcase that I can take with me? And he thought, you know what? I'll cash in some of my money and I'll buy gold. And he said, I'll fill that suitcase up with gold because that will represent the majority of my wealth. So the man died, and when he died, he went to the pearly gates. And he got there, and he had his suitcase, and St. Peter said, Brother, he said, you're not allowed to bring anything with you. He said, no, 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 no. No, God and I have this understanding. 
Me and the Lord talked, and the Lord said I could bring a suitcase full. And Peter said, hang on a minute. So Peter went inside the gates to check and see if the store was right, came back out. He said, well, your store has been verified. You can come on. He said, by the way, he said, what did you bring? And they got him a suitcase, and he said, look at all this gold I brought. And Peter looked at him and said, we were needing more pavement. <laughs> the Bible says we're going to walk on streets of gold. Streets of gold that's like transparent glass. Now, you ladies, I'm sure, most of you ladies like jewelry. I can take my wife to a jewelry store, and it'll be the best day of her life. She loves to look at jewelry. We often go to Sam's Club. And when we go to Sam's Club, if you've been there, it's a big place. And so when I get to Sam's Club, I kind of have in my mind, I've got to get this, 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 and this, and then we'll head right out the door. Well, we get right inside the door, and it's the jewelry counter. Now, my wife sees that jewelry counter every time we go in. She most likely has it memorized what's in the case, and if they've moved it, if they moved it, she knows it. She loves, but you know, she'll stand there at that jewelry case and look at ones, and I mean, they're little. They're little. Listen, the Bible says the foundation, this city that's 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles, the foundation, excuse me, the foundation is going to be those precious jewels. I think the ladies are going to like heaven. Now imagine with me for a moment, if you will, all of that beauty. Now imagine with me for a moment the glory of God radiating. The glory of God radiating through all of those things. Friend, heaven is going to be more beautiful than your mind can imagine or begin to comprehend. The human mind doesn't have the ability to comprehend all the things that God has prepared. The 12 gates around the city, each gate made of a single pearl. Wow. You know, we think... Wow, how, where was the, where's the oyster that joker came out of? <laughs> Let me tell you, if you could create a single pearl, you know, ladies get all excited. I got a pearl necklace and they got all these little ones around their neck. God's going to do it so good, honey. He's going to make a whole gate out of one of them. <laughs> and you know, he can do that because he knows how to create the little one and he knows how to create the big ones. Almost a hundred years ago in Sweden, there was a pastor who, through some life events, wandered away from God. As a result of his choices, he lost his family. He lost the church that he had been at. He lost the place of ministry that he had been involved in. And this former pastor began to live a life of drunkenness and sin. He actually ended up spending some time in prison because of his misdeeds. Throughout his time while being incarcerated, he wrote in a journal these words, I drifted from God, and I became so embittered with myself and the world and all the people who looked on me with suspicion. Somehow in that state, God broke through. Aren't you glad God can break through? Somehow in that state, God broke through. And he touched my heart so that I called out to the Lord for forgiveness. As a result of that experience, he wrote the words that later became a song that many of you know. Like a dove when hunted. Frightened as a wounded fawn was I. Broken hearted, yet he healed me. He will heed the sinner's cry. Love so divine, so great, so wondrous, all my sins he then forgave. I will sing his praise forever for his blood, his power to save. The words go on, he, the pearly gates will open so that I may enter in. For he purchased my redemption and forgave me all my sin. Friend, you and I 
can experience the same redemption and know that he will admit us through the gates of heaven. If you have chosen Jesus Christ as your Savior, the message about uh, where we're going, the things we're talking about in heaven will only cause a spirit of excitement and anticipation in your life. But friend, if you don't know Jesus, when we begin to talk about death and we begin to talk about heaven, we begin to talk about eternity, there's a nervousness and a quivering that fills our hearts. You've sat in services as like I, experienced the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and it seems that as the preacher would speak, your heart would beat faster and faster and faster. God is drawing you. We read the scripture from Revelation 3 and 20 earlier. It says he's standing at the door knocking. Friend, when you're experiencing that, it's God reaching out to you. It's God reaching out and saying, be saved. The Bible says God desires that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance in Jesus Christ. God's desire, friend, is that all of us would be saved. God's desire is that every person in this room Every person outside of this room would know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. But the truth is, this world that you and I live in, it's pretty messed up, isn't it? It's a mess. God has given us a glimpse of what is yet to come. God has given us that picture so we will put all of our focus on this life and get discouraged as a result. But friend, you can lift up your eyes and see that the best is yet ahead of you. Friend, even though heaven is exclusive through Jesus Christ, you can know that you're ready for heaven. I shared in the first service this morning, I had not intended to, but my mind went back and I want to share it with you. When I was a kid, we used to all walk to, some of you that are old enough remember what it was like, all the kids in the neighborhood, we all walked to school together. And uh, we were walking to school one day, and, you know, I, I grew up in a home where, where my dad was a preacher, and so, honest truth with you, I heard the gospel from the time I was a little boy uh, all my life, I heard the gospel. But I had a friend who lived two doors down from us. His name was Charlie. Charlie didn't grow up in the same home that I did. In fact, Charlie's home was, was filled with a lot of drunkenness and a lot of difficulty of life. Many of you can relate to that. And Charlie and I one day were walking to school, and I don't know, I was probably third or fourth grade, and I still to this day have no idea what prompted our conversation. I only remember this part of it. I looked at Charlie, and I said, Charlie, are you going to heaven? And Charlie said, I hope so. Now, I'll be honest with you. That was a long, long time ago. But Charlie's words still ring out in my mind. It's because I think there's a lot of people who, when we talk about heaven, they say, I hope, I hope I can go to heaven. I hope I can go to heaven. Friend, I want to tell you, you don't have to wonder anymore. Jesus Christ has paid the price, and Jesus Christ has provided everything that you and I need so that we can know beyond the shadow of a doubt that we're ready for heaven. You don't have to say, wow, I hope he'll forgive me. I hope he'll let me in. You can say, I know that Jesus Christ is my Savior, and Jesus provided everything that I need to be ready for heaven. Now, friend, today, I don't know what your past is like. I know there's a lot of people have difficulty climbing over what they've done before. They say, yeah, but pastor, God can't forgive me because God knows all that I've done. Friend, I don't know what all you've done. But you're right, he does. And he's able to forgive that. There's nothing you've done he can't forgive. There's no past he can't redeem. No life he can't turn around. Because you see, that's the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Friend, Jesus Christ can turn your life around. And today, when you walk out the back doors of this room, you don't have to walk out going, man, if heaven were to call my name today, I hope I'm ready. 
But you can walk out and say, you know what? I know. I can't wait to get to heaven. Heaven's going to be so incredible. God's prepared incredible things for me. And I'm looking for the day when I see Jesus face to face. You know what? I want to tell something to you. Heaven is going to be great because of all the things I've shared with you out of the passage this morning. Heaven is going to be incredible because God's going to be there. But you know, God does something really incredible in His grace and mercy. Many of you have loved ones who have gone on before, and they're already there. And God, in His grace and mercy, you know what He gets to do? He's going to let us be with them for all eternity. Some of you have spent a short time with them on this earth. And when you look back at it, you go, man, that time went so fast. I can't wait to see my dad. My grandparents are there. I know you're like I am. I have loved ones that I miss so bad. There's not a day or week that goes by that I don't remember them and think about them and long to see them. Listen, heaven's going to be so incredible because we're going to get there one day. And listen, we're not going to part again. Never going to have to say goodbye again. There's not going to be any more funerals there. We're not going to have any more sickness, disease. That's going to prematurely take people out of this life. Friend, we're going to be there forever. Listen, you don't want to miss heaven. You don't want to miss heaven. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning for every person in this room. Every person, Father, right now that can hear my voice speaking. Lord, I pray for them this morning. Lord, I know there's so many things that work to distract and things that try to work to pull our attention away from heaven. Lord, life is so busy. Life is so stressful. And Lord, it seems that life keeps all of our focused attention on the here and now. Lord, I pray that you'll help us lift up our eyes beyond those things and to see heaven that's waiting for us. And Father, I especially want to pray for those in this room today that, Father, they're just not sure they're ready for heaven. There's an element of, uh, they're just wondering, am I really ready? Am I really ready for heaven? There's a nervousness. They don't feel confident. There's a nervousness that fills their hearts. Lord, I pray this morning that they won't have that nervousness anymore. And I pray they won't have that confusion anymore. I pray today when they leave this place in the name of Jesus, that, Lord, they will know beyond the shadow of a doubt, fully confident that they're ready for heaven. But, Lord, I know that I can't do it for them and they can't do it themselves. Lord, it only comes from you. So, Lord, we look to you today. And I ask that you draw people today, draw people today to come in a right relationship with you so that you can make them ready for heaven, I pray. In Jesus' name, with all his bow, please, no one moving around for the next few moments, if you will. Friend, I want to talk to you for a minute. Are you ready for heaven? Are you really ready for heaven? Are you kind of like my friend Charlie who said, I hope that I get to go to heaven? Are you saying, I'm not quite sure there's some reservation on my side? I just don't know. Friend, if that's you this morning, I want to tell you, you can know and you can be sure today. You don't have to wonder any longer. But I tell you, it comes only through Jesus Christ. The Bible says... If we confess our sin to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, he's got to do that, friend, because there won't be any unrighteousness in heaven. So he's got to cleanse us here to get us ready to go there. This morning, I'm going to ask you, friend, if you're not ready for heaven, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to point you out. I'm not going to do anything. Except this morning, if you're not ready for heaven, would you just slip up a hand right now and say, Pastor, would you please remember me in prayer? I'm not sure that I'm ready for heaven. Right where you said, yes. You say, I'm just not sure. I don't have that confidence, Pastor, but I want to have it. 
How many others this morning you lift your hand? Say, please remember me in prayer. Please remember me in prayer. I want to be sure today, yes. Yes, you can put your hand down, friend, after you've raised it. How many others? How many others? You say, I'm just not sure. Yes. Jesus loves you so much. Oh, Oh, Jesus. How many others? Pray while I wait. While I wait. I want to give you every opportunity I can. Yes. tell you something before I pray with your heads bowed. Listen, I'm going to pray for you, but my prayer won't won't get it. I need you to talk to him right where you're at. You say, what do I say? Listen, friends, it's easy as this. Lord Jesus, would you forgive me my sin, cleanse my life, and make me ready for heaven. Friend, it doesn't have to be long, drug out, or hard. You don't have to have the right words. Just talk to him. Tell him what you need him to do in your life. Lord, I'm afraid I'm not ready. I need you to make me ready for heaven. I give you my life and everything I am. So I'm going to ask you this. I pray for us as a body. I want you to pray that prayer right where you're at. Father, I pray for each person in this room right now. God, you know us by name. You know everything about us. Lord, I just pray right now that you'll make yourself very real to each person. Lord, remind them how incredibly you love them. And Lord, would you just talk to them right now? Because Lord, there's people in this room talking to you right now, Father. Lord, would you come in with mercy? Would you come in with grace? Lord, the past, they've had a hard time climbing over. God, help them climb over it in Jesus' name. Forgive their past. Forgive their past. Cleanse them of all sin. Wash them. Wash them in the name of Jesus and make them clean. Lord, I trust you for it today. I'm leaning heavily upon it. That God, you're doing things in the hearts of these men and women. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, I feel prompted to do something. I know we just prayed. I just feel prompted right now in my heart. I want to lead us all in a prayer all across this room. And I'm going to ask that everybody will pray with me. And especially those of you that lifted your hand earlier. I just feel prompted right now in my heart to do this. Would you pray this prayer with me all across the house? Dear Lord Jesus, I call on you today. And I ask you to make me ready for heaven. You know my life. And you know my heart. And you know that I need you. So today I declare that I need you. And I ask you to come into my life and be my Savior. Make me ready for heaven. I don't want to miss it. So I need you to make me ready. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Friend, listen to me. There's no no magical words. There's not a special church prayer, religious prayer. You just need to talk to Jesus. And that's what you've just done. 
Listen, friend, if you prayed that prayer made from your heart, I believe you're on your way to heaven today. I believe heaven, everything we read about, is yours. It's yours. You don't have to go home now saying, well, I hope. You can go home today saying, I know. And friend, when you lay your head on the pillow tonight, you know, you can say, you know what? If I don't wake up in the morning on this side, I know where I'm going to be when I do wake up. You can know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Listen, friend, share the gospel with other people. You have people all around you. Be ready to share the gospel with them at a moment's notice. Would you stand with me? Isn't God good to us? Man, His grace is so wonderful. Now, Father, I know you love these people with a special love. And I know, Lord, that you look upon them like nobody else looks upon them. You look on them because they're the apple of your eye. You're so proud of them. You love them so much. You desire to pour good things into their lives. I pray, God, you'll give them everything they need for living this life in you. Father, would you even give them the desires of their hearts? Lord, as we live our lives to honor you in all ways. Lord, would you bless them? Would you keep them? God, I pray you'll give them an incredible afternoon and evening. Lord, I pray. God, life is so busy. Lord, would you just give these people a really good night of rest? Lord, your word says you give your beloved rest, and these are your beloved. So, Lord, I pray they'll sleep like a little baby. I pray, God, you'll refresh them, renew them in their body, their mind, and their spirit. And, Lord... Will you just continue to be good every day in their life, I pray. And I thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you all. We love you. Have a great week. May the joy of the Lord always be your strength. God bless you.